um, as well as, you know, some of these other, these other interesting characters. So um, one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life is, is I get to meet and work with some really great folks, some really creative folks, and then being able to have the opportunity to take characters from a legend and, uh, you know, help lead the charge on how these, this new IP gets kind of out into the world is, is super cool and fun. Um, so rabbit is the first thing that's live and we've been, uh, kind of slowly teasing. We're letting the Hedera folks kind of come into our open beta and give us feedback. So there's, uh, at the moment you can still go get some of the, uh, first iteration of rabbit that's, that's out. Um, if you go to acme labs.xyz, uh, shop the rabbit collection, you'll see some of what's out now. Uh, and then the other, uh, bit of IP that we've launched and developed Done. is, Oh yeah. Before I before you go, I want to interrupt and say, Rabbit is also a um, print and digital combo, which we haven't seen a lot in the space. So you can actually um, buy your Rabbit. There are two versions of Rabbit. Um, one is unboxed. Part of that is because um, we are working with a broader uh, Looney Tunes collector fan base that isn't used to buying blind boxes. Um, like we are in the NFT space. I also have to mention I'm I'm a collector myself. I've been collecting Solana for a long time. Switched it all over to H bar not too long ago. Um, but so there's a, a crated option, which is your traditional NFT blind box. You get what you get, um, and then you have a more expensive uh, unboxed version, uncrated version that you can actually pick your um, rabbit. And that is because we have a broad audience that isn't used to to buying blind box. Um, each NFT does come with a print as well. Um, so basically the strategy there is when you're dealing with a broad audience who isn't used to, um, you know, the way that we operate in, in this space, um, it functions like the old CD with a digital copy when they were trying to introduce digital music to music listeners, right? You're buying a print and you also get this digital copy, which is your, your NFT um, that lives in your wallet and you can go further down that rabbit hole. Um, if you would like to, um, or, you know, it can just sit in your wallet forever and you got your print and you're happy. And so, so we are doing, um, the physical and digital combination and, um, you can still get that on our website. There are two options. So if you're going to get one, um, that's why there are different prices and the crate is actually rabbits. We've had some confusion around that. So, um, that's just a little more background on uh, rabbit and, and what you get when you, when you buy a rabbit. No, and I should say, um, <clears throat> for anybody just joining right now, um, obviously with Acme Labs, they do have IP from the Chuck Jones estate. If you're not aware of who Chuck Jones is, they have a pretty finite definition um, on acmelabs.xyz. Chuck Jones created over 300 films with a seven-decade career in animation. Um, films are, nom are uh, nominated for nine Academy Awards, winning three. Um, Lifetime Achievement Oscar by the Academy in 1996 co-created possibly the most memorable and enduring set of characters in history i think we can all remember you know bugs bunny daffy duck elmer fudd porky pig the list of characters he created himself includes roadrunner wiley Ki so by himself created roadrunner wiley coyote marvin martian pepe Le Pew, which i remember i remember watching those cartoons when i was little <laughs> i don't even know if they could necessarily air some of that stuff anymore um gossamer and many others chuck jones was the first animation artist to have a retrospective at the museum of modern modern art in new york and thank you tiki for uh bringing up the fidgetal aspect i was gonna ask about that um i do want to uh get to ask stater real quick because i think it's important you, you guys mentioned regulations and i and i certainly appreciate that you guys are kind of doing this from the from the art standpoint first, uh, not necessarily like promising uh, future utility, uh, you know, just kind of promising the art that what that is within this kind of amazing collection of uh, IP from Chuck Jones. So I wanted to ask Stater now being that we, you know, you guys are, you know, operate staking platforms across multiple platforms. Can you guys touch? Cause I think you had a space about this with the H bar foundation, the H bar bowl, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, especially with the Kraken aspects, um, them, them potentially like, you know, having to, you know, they were levied out a fine basically, um, for staking aspects within their platform. Can you touch base on where, you know, where you guys are at right now from the regulatory stance? Like what is, you know, is state or and all your solutions like concerned about what's going on from a regulations aspect right now? Uh, how are you kind of 
going to be willing to adapt like moving forward, depending on potentially what comes down the line. Um, yeah, you know, just just kind of your thoughts around the entire aspect right now sur- surrounding staking. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a great question, right, and very topical because it's uh, the, there's there's quite a lot of information there, and I think it's uh, also uh, sort of uh, important to just clearly de- uh, delineate what's been happening uh, and what we do as well, right? So I think the first thing to mention there, uh, Kraken and a lot of the CFI staking pla- uh, staking programs aren't really staking programs only. Uh, they call it that, but at the back, some of them are a combination of staking plus lending, uh, plus in some cases, some DeFi strategies as well, right? That's really basically an asset management solution. It's not really a staking solution, right? So I think that the opacity uh, and the fact that a significant portion of that was actually not staking as you know it, but but mostly learning was what got, uh, lending was what got uh, Kraken into uh, trouble and rightly so, right? Um, I think uh, what, how we see uh, this sort of renewed or new uh, sort of interest in, in making sure uh, users know where their funds are going, uh, we see it as, you know, long-term positive. You know, uh, I, we totally realize that, you know, in, in the midst of uh, midst of negative news in the industry, uh, completely decentralized and permissionless protocols like ours might get mixed into uh, by just because of you using the same term. But we use staking as a very, very technical term, which basically is taking the na- uh, kind of taking the native token and giving it off to validators. And with, say, for example, with say, HBARX or any of our staking solutions, I mean, you have on-chain verifiable data of exactly where the yield is coming from and on-chain verifiable data that we are actually at no point taking custody of the funds, right? Uh, so we're not involved in the process. We're basically providing a technology solution. And then the yield is also coming from the fact uh, that it's the the L1 token or the native token is actually being staked on nodes and validators, right? Uh, so we see a clear distinction uh, between uh, centralized, what has been, in our, in, at least in my opinion, mislabeled as staking, uh, but in most cases like an earned program or a vault, right? Uh, and, you know, completely decentralized permissionless protocols like ours which have a clear uh, sort of yield generation transparency associated with them. Uh, so I think uh, we will hopefully get to a situation where, uh, you know, clear rules are put in place uh, for marketing uh, some of these things uh, and uh, for sort of upholding transparency and letting users do their own research and make, make their own decisions. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, what kind of risks and returns uh, trade off that they want to make. And I think that's the really the, at the core of the, this sort of whole um, sort of volley of regulations. And in some cases, I, I do feel some of it uh, will uh, will actually turn out to be positive. Uh, the only caveat there, I would say, is like I, I do not I wish that it doesn't like stifle innovation. I don't think it will. Uh, but I just wish it if they don't step too far. Uh, but at least from what we've seen uh, so far, there's nothing, uh, nothing like that, or nothing to suggest that. Uh, so I think long term, it's going to be positive uh, for regulators and users alike, right, to distinguish very clearly uh, between something just being labeled as staking and then the technical process of staking. Uh, and more broadly between, uh, you know, uh, offers of custody-based, a uh, more opaque yield versus a decentralized and transparent yield generation, uh, which we, of course, want to espouse and champion. A hundred percent. And I always like to ask, and I'll ask both of you guys, <clears throat> um, or all three of you guys up here, I guess, um, you know, from a community standpoint, can you guys talk about your experience? Um, and I know, I know this is a Hedera space, you know, your, your experience within the Hedera ecosystem with community members. Um, and then, 
you know, also how you guys are kind of staying in, in communication and contact with community that is potentially interested in, you know, hasn't, you know, looked maybe at your projects yet, but is onboarding in, like, what are those kind of communication metric or mechanisms that you guys have with, with the members that you guys are onboarding and what's been your experience thus far? I'll start with Stater, I guess. Yeah, no, I think it's been amazing to kind of build with this community and always use the term with because I, I remember back in the day when we were just kind of uh, starting our, our Twitter and our Telegram for specifically for Hedera. I think it was about March. Uh, and we were just putting out concept notes and and kind of putting out a white paper and just getting people aware. I think we formed a very, very uh, tight knit, I would say, a group uh, on TG of users and potential users that turned into users and people who were, you know, uh, quite clear and direct with us in asking very pointed questions, uh, but also helping the solution move forward, right? I think while we were able to answer 80, 85% of the questions, the 15, 20% actually helped us in that design phase to actually make a product, make a product better for the community. I, I remember uh, some of the uh, best sort of or most well-received pieces of content uh, and explanations and blogs and videos came from ideas that we had with interacting with the community when they were proactively telling us, hey, we don't understand this or we want to see more detail on this. Can you add that to the comms? And similarly, hey, can you add this to the product? Can you add it to the FAQs? Can, can you show this number uh, on screen? And and that dialogue is really continued all throughout, right? So we, we launched V1, which, which only had staking. We then launched V2. Uh, we launched V3, which are a stable, sort of fully integrated version of staking. Uh, and all the time, our community members have been absolutely instrumental in making sure that we put out a solution which is really, really robust for the entire ecosystem. Uh, and they've been generous with their time uh, and also their opinions uh, around testing the solution and on making sure we get things right. So, you know, some of the folks <laughs> uh, I have sort of interacted with a lot across multiple months uh, and, and seeing them across spaces and all, always seeing them on, on, on TG uh, and stuff like that. And it's, it's uh, I mean, they're, they're almost like my friends because we, we've interacted so much. And so it's been really great sort of working in um, with the community. What I would say is because I, I look at other networks as well. I think I, the community on Hedera is probably the most engaged I've seen across networks. And some of the networks might have more users and stuff. Uh, but the quality of feedback and the quality of engagement, uh, uh, if you do interact with the community, I think you can really create, a, they'll tell you what they want and they'll tell you, uh, and most, you know, if you're transparent with them, they'll uh, sort of appreciate that as well. So that's kind of things that have worked for us. And it's been a pleasure sort of creating for the community and creating with the community as well. I have to say, um, you know, uh, you know, being being in this space for not a ton of time, but for, you know, five, however many years, five years, six years at this point, um, a lot of the stories that you hear from people that are actually working within blockchain companies or working with, with projects, and I'm not talking about um, paid marketing or any of that stuff. I'm talking about people actually working on teams, people actually working within projects. It's amazing how many people I run into that literally started just by being a member in a discord or a member in a telegram that have that just try to help do certain things um and then they end up you know getting kind of a, an opportunity within an actual organization which is pretty crazy um but that that's that's just one thing that i think a lot of people don't realize about this space is you know it, it needs it takes a community of builders and a lot of those builders are going to come from the community themselves um as these projects and ecosystems develop and innovate, uh, they need, you know, critical thinkers and they need people willing to just do and not, you know, talk. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic point. And I would, I, I want to ask Acme the same thing. So um, your experience so far within the Hedera ecosystem, if you, uh, for, from the community standpoint, if you guys could touch on that, that'd be great. Um, you want to jump in? You want me to jump in, John? Uh, I'll kick it off. And then Josh, if you want to, you know, pepper in some, Marketing Got it. magic. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, we actually have two core audiences that we're we're you know kind of speaking to and building for. Right. One is 
um, what I consider our, our Web3 native audience. Uh, these are folks that are much more technologically sophisticated. They have already kind of been been onboarded into a Web3 uh, you know, ecosystem. They understand wallets. They understand NFTs and smart contracts and cryptocurrencies and this you know, broader kind of Web3 stack of technology. Um, and then we have this completely different audience who is Web2 native and either afraid of or unaware of or you know, maybe misinformed about some of the core value props and how some of the uh, Web3 side work. 